Oh, good morning, Eastwood Church. If you were trying to watch our live stream this morning, you'll know that um, it didn't go very well. Uh, we think it was because of our internet connection in the worship center, but um, we apologize for that. It's um, really wanted to be able to provide a way for us to uh, do this together, and unfortunately it didn't work out. So I'm going to record uh, this sermon for you, and that um, you can have it for the rest of this day, and hopefully it will be a blessing to you. So before I begin, I'm just going to pray, and then I'm going to read from the scriptures, and then I'll, I'll deliver what I have already delivered once already. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We're so grateful, our Father, that you've given it to us to teach us, to help us grow, to mature in our walk with the Lord. And Father, we pray that uh, as we study this morning, as we learn from the Apostle Paul's sufferings, uh, that we may be encouraged in ours, that we may be comforted and strengthened. And so, our Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, sufferings, trials, afflictions, and sorrows are all part of our sin-cursed world. Sooner or later, we will all go through some kind of difficulty uh, which will hurt us in some way. Some of those trials and troubles will be minor inconveniences and Others will shake the very foundations of our faith. When one difficulty is passed, another will certainly follow, and this will continue throughout our lives until the final calamity comes, our very deaths. When Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, it was partly this knowledge that caused him to lament, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. If life is simply a series of trials and afflictions culminating in death, what an emptiness. What a chasing after the wind. It's truly depressing. It is even more distressing for the vast majority of people who have no confidence or assurance about what happens to them when they die. It's no wonder that people who have no hope turn to drugs or to alcohol or sex or money, or even worse, perhaps just decide to check out of life. What else is there to look for? What are Christians to do with the knowledge that life is a series of troubles and trials? Do we grieve as the world grieves, who have no hope? If not, what is a Christian to think about the reality that we face trials of many kinds? How should we react when the inevitable trouble or affliction comes upon us? What should we think about our current situation as we socially isolate in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, to answer these questions, we are going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul to learn from how he approached suffering. In the first message in this series, we considered 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. And we noted eight biblical reasons for suffering. We noted that God uses trouble to show us that we're true believers. He uses trouble to teach us to rely on him. He uses trouble to give us a greater desire for heaven. And he uses trouble to show us what we really love. He uses trouble to teach us to obey him. He uses trouble to reveal his love for us. And he uses trouble to make us more useful. And then finally, the main point of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, uh, God uses trouble to equip us to comfort others. Brothers and sisters, God does not waste troubles and trials, but uses them for his glory and our good. And today we're going to consider how abundant sufferings result in abundant comfort. And specifically, how sharing in Christ's sufferings results in comfort, and how Paul's sufferings resulted in comfort for the Corinthians. Paul says in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, um, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God comforts us so that we will use that uh, experience of comfort to bless others. And we're going to see how this reality uh, influenced Paul's thinking about his own trials. 
My goal is that we would cease looking at suffering as something to be avoided at all costs and embrace it as a powerful tool that God uses to teach us dependence upon him and to make us a blessing to others. Well, let's read the passage together. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted to us through the prayers of many. Well, our Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you will use it to bless us, to encourage us. Lord, may we have eyes to see and ears to hear and uh, wills to obey whatever we learn from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the title of my sermon is Sharing in Christ's Sufferings. And the first thing I want you to notice is that abundant suffering results in abundant comfort. Suffering, or the experience of trouble, and the experience of God's comfort are directly related Paul recognized a divine ordered correspondence between the intensity of sufferings and the abundance of God's comfort. In 2 Corinthians 1.5 we read, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. We share abundantly in Christ's sufferings. The first thing that we notice in this verse is that the word abundantly occurs twice. And that word means plentiful, to exist in large quantities, to be present over abundantly. And then we also notice that the word share occurs two times. That word is actually not in the original. It is supplied by the translators to give the thought or idea of community. So literally we could read, for as we abound in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we abound in comfort also. Paul's personal experience taught him that abundant suffering was a normal part of the believer's life. In Philippians 1.29 he wrote, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. In almost every place that Paul visited on his church planting trips, he faced opposition of many kinds, both inside and outside the church. When Paul went to a city, the Jews often attacked him and stirred up the unbelieving Gentiles to join in the attack. After a church was established, he had to deal with remaining sins, divisions, false teachers, and defections. And then when he left the city, those who had been attacking him refocused their wrath upon the new believers that he left behind. This in turn caused Paul suffering because he loved them and didn't want to see them turn away from the truth. And then all of these sufferings were piled on top of what he endured just traveling from city to city. Well, just as Paul experienced suffering, his expectation was that every believer would also experience abundant suffering. In 2 Timothy 3.12, he write, Paul told Timothy, that everyone who purposed to live a godly life in Christ Jesus would face persecution. P. 
Peter echoes this in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, where he says that believers are not to be surprised by trials, but to rejoice in them because the spirit of glory and of God rests on them. The implication is that the spirit of glory resting on us will of necessity bring us into conflict with the world. You see, you can't have the spirit of glory in and upon you and not have trouble. Why is this, you ask? Well, the spirit of glory causes those in whom he dwells to think, talk, and live in a way that brings them into conflict with the world. Now, we know that the Roman world in which Paul lived was polytheistic. It allowed for many gods, but worshipped the emperor as supreme along with the state. And of course, the expectation is that all of the citizens of the Roman world would take that stance and worship the emperor as supreme. Uh, there were many community-wide festivals and feast days in honor of Caesar and Rome. And when a person became a believer, they stopped participating in those religious events, and this obviously caused them to stand out. As a result, they were accused of being traitors and of committing vile crimes like cannibalism and sexual orgies. Uh, this came from their misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper and the love feasts. Such lies fueled the hatred of unbelievers around the churches and sometimes res resulted in violent attacks and even death. You know, for most of us, this kind of persecution is incomprehensible. Western life and culture for decades has embraced some form of Christianity and as a result, it's been very easy to be a Christian and not attract hateful attention. Unless, of course, one was zealous in evangelism and faithfully calling out the sins of the city, of, of the society. As a consequence, we have experienced very little of sharing in Christ's sufferings. However, as our Canadian culture has become more and more secular and pluralistic, the pressure to be nice, to be tolerant, to embrace relativity, that's the idea that there is no truth, or that if there is, it's all the same. To approve sexual immorality and reproductive rights, uh, that pressure has increased exponentially, and as a result, faithful believers are experiencing more and more of Christ's sufferings. And we're becoming more and more like the Christians of the ages who have suffered for Christ. Well, notice that not only do we suffer affliction, but we share abundantly in comfort as well. Since the sufferings of the Christian abound, so does their comfort. The comfort experienced is directly related to the suffering endured, as we noticed in verse 4. And in the second part of verse 5, Paul connects the amount of comfort we experience with the amount of suffering that we endure. Notice in verse 5, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Those who experience the most suffering experience the most comfort. This fact is echoed by the psalmist in Psalm 94 verse 19 when he said, When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. You can hear in his heart the joy that he has that in spite of his many cares, uh, God's consolations were helping him and cheering him along. Now note the Apostle Peter's teaching on this in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, where he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you were insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Believers who willingly suffer for Christ receive two wonderful blessings, according to Peter. Notice in verse 14, the temporal blessings. They receive comfort in this life. He says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ... You are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
Brothers and sisters, when we suffer for our faithfulness to Christ, we experience the presence of the Spirit as in no other time. And I know that many of us have experienced that. Uh, I know that there are times when I have been in great trouble and trial, and those troubles and trials have driven me closer to Christ than at other times. And it's interesting that as I've come out of them and come into a time of peace, that trouble has been lifted. I've, I've kind of missed the, the, the closeness that I felt to my Lord in those times of trouble. Well, Peter says that not only do we have a temporal blessing, but there is an eternal blessing. Notice verse 13. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Here, Peter connects sharing Christ's sufferings with rejoicing and gladness when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. I expect we're going to hear from his lips if we have suffered with him and done it with joy and gladness that we're going to hear that well done, good and faithful servant. Well, notice as we move into verses, verse 6 and verses 8 and 9 that Paul tells us that his affliction, his affliction, he's moving here from the affliction that is generally felt by all believers to the affliction that he endured. And he tells us that his affliction and comfort was for their comfort and salvation. Notice verses, verse 6 and verses 8 and 9. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul and his team endured much in the way of affliction in order to bring the Corinthians out of the darkness of sin and the fear of death. Let's think for a moment about Paul's affliction. Now we're not told about the situation, the particular situation which produced Paul's affliction. It's not disclosed. But if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and look at verses 23 through 28, we're given a general perspective of the kinds of things that Paul endured in order to bring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to many. Notice what he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. And we'll take it right from the middle of that passage. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes lest one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of, of my anxiety for all the churches. Wow, it's amazing what, our, uh, what the Apostle Paul went through in his gospel ministry. And then remember the great discouragement that Paul experienced when he came to Corinth. He had been through an especially difficult time of ministry. And as he comes to Corinth, he's discouraged. And he's in need of comfort. He describes himself, he, he uses these words to describe himself. Weakness, fear, much trembling, in distress, weary. And we know that his suffering included both physical afflictions and psychological or spiritual anguish. Now, in our passage in 2 Corinthians, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, Paul tells us in verse 6, he says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings 
that we suffer. And then he says in verse 8, we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. And here's what I want you to pay attention to. He says, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Paul's telling us here about how severe this particular trial was. Again, we don't know what it was, but he says utterly burdened. And these are superlatives. He's taking one superlative and piling it on top of another. That word utterly means extraordinary overabundance. And then that burden means distressed with extreme sorrow, too heavy to bear. John MacArthur summarizes it in his commentary as crushed to the point of depression. So great was the affliction that he says he despaired even of life itself. This was a trial so heavy and crushing that his life no longer mattered to him. You might picture in your mind a person carrying such a heavy load that his legs buckle and he's crushed under the load. Or perhaps think of a ship that is so loaded that it begins to sink beneath the waves. Such was the depth of Paul's affliction. You know, I've experienced some of that in my life with the death of a loved one. And I remember feeling so overwhelmed with sorrow that everything else in my life became insignificant or meaningless. Well, I think that's where the Apostle Paul is, what the, what the Apostle Paul is trying to, to share with us. And the result that Paul felt that he was under the sentence of death, he, he thought he was going to die. Such, so great was this time of trial. Now, why did God ordain such an extreme affliction for such a faithful servant? I mean, surely, if anyone deserves to be free of such suffering, it's faithful servants, right? Well, Paul tells us that God's purpose was to teach him not to trust in himself, but in God's resurrection power. Oh, what a vitally important lesson this is that we all need to learn. John Calvin says of our sinful tendency to trust in ourselves, he says, the fleshly confidence with which we are puffed up is so obstinate that it cannot be overthrown in any other way than by our falling into utter despair. Wow, what a powerful statement. You see, we don't, know, we don't understand how sinful and displeasing to God our self-confidence is. So he must put us through great suffering in order to rid us of it. John Flavel, the Puritan pastor, says of this paradox, man's extremity is God's opportunity. And all he's saying there is that God often puts us in very difficult circumstances in order to come near to us and demonstrate his love and his care and his protection, and most of all, his control over all things. And so God took Paul to the place where no human power could deliver him, so that he would look to God as the only source of his relief. And when he was comforted, he had no doubt whatsoever of God's sustaining grace and restoring power. Though through the extremity of his suffering, Paul learned not to trust in his own strength or ability, but in the resurrection power of God. As Paul learned to rely on the power of God, he purposed to use that knowledge to bless others. And so he says, it's for your comfort and your salvation that I am afflicted. Now, Paul places, did you notice that Paul places the word salvation after the word comfort? This is important because this indicates that he has more in mind than simply coming to a saving knowledge of Christ through repentance and faith. You see, salvation is not just the initial event of repentance and faith but it also includes the ongoing work of salvation. Paul tells us about, tell, tell, uh, speaks of this reality in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now notice he describes us, he describes believers as being saved. They are in the process of being saved. So although we were saved, we are also being saved. Although salvation is a once-for-all event, it is also an ongoing reality. 
what Paul learned and experienced through his affliction, became a powerful tool to help the Corinthian believers grow in their walk with the Lord. Now, to give us an idea of how Paul's afflictions produced comfort for the Corinthians, consider what Paul told the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 13. Paul said in that verse that his sufferings were their glory and their honor, or their honor. So how were Paul's sufferings their glory or their honor? Well, there are a number of ways in which this was so. First, the things which he suffered to bring them the gospel and to strengthen and equip them resulted in their being saved and then their being edified and glorified. Also, through Paul's sufferings, they were able to see the power of the gospel in action. The power of the gospel was made visible through Paul's sufferings. You see, Paul could teach them and say that God is all-powerful, God is sovereign, God is good, God is great. We know that many times uh, Paul's gospel message was rejected. He was often attacked. And as Paul remained faithful to that gospel through his sufferings, that was a powerful testimony to those he was witnessing to that what he was saying was actually true. And then finally, the Ephesian believers looked at what Paul suffered in order for them to be saved and be strengthened in their faith, and they were filled with wonder and joy. So we see in this just one example of how Paul's sufferings resulted in glory for the Ephesian Christians, and we know that this was also true for the Corinthian believers. Now I want, to, I want us to think for a moment about Paul's comfort. Not only was Paul afflicted for the good and well-being of the Corinthian believers, but he was comforted for that purpose as well. At the end of verse 6, Paul says, If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. How did God comfort Paul? Well, in Acts 18, 1 through 17, we learned how God encouraged and comforted him. God gave him friends and co-workers in Aquila and Priscilla. He brought Timothy and Silas back to him with encouraging news from the churches that they had planted and strengthened. God saved some who had been powerful enemies. God encouraged him personally. He came to him with the assurance of his presence, a promise of protection, and the promise of a harvest. And then finally, God turned the attack of his enemies to nothing. So having been so comforted, Paul was able to encourage the Corinthians that God would do the same for them. Now notice Paul's confidence. In verse 6, he says that they would be comforted as they patiently endured the same struggles with weakness, fear, as they experienced or endured the same struggles with weakness, fear, trembling, distress, and weariness as they remembered how God had so graciously and helped Paul and comforted him, they could be sure that they also would experience that same comfort. That knowledge gave them great encouragement. They were confident that since God had helped Paul, he would help them. This was Paul's confident expectation in verse 7. In 2 Corinthians 1.7, Paul says, Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you also will share in our comfort. Paul says, our hope for you is unshaken. Remember that Paul's great concern for them, as it was for all the churches, was that when persecution inevitably came upon them, they would be unshaken in their faith and able to stand firm. He didn't want them to fall by the wayside. He didn't want them to wither on the vine. And note Paul's underlying conviction that these persecutions would strengthen them and result in their comfort. Paul repeats this confident expectation in verse 10 as he thought of his own experience. Listen to what he says. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Paul knew that God would bring him safely through every trial and trouble until it was time for him to go to be with the Lord. Paul speaks of this in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18. 
It's a wonderful verse that we often are reminded of. He says there, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I hope you hear in these verses that Paul was convinced that because God had so wonderfully delivered him, he would do the same for the Corinthian believers whom he so deeply loved. Well, the last thing I want you to notice this morning is the opportunity of participating in Paul's ministry. Paul urged the Corinthians in verse 11 to participate with him in the work to which he had been called. Notice what it says, what he says. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Paul was a firm believer in what James wrote in chapter 5 and verse 16 of his letter. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. Paul therefore considered the prayers of believers as crucial to the success of his ministry. So he pleaded with the believers in Rome in chapter 15, verse 30 of Romans. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Do you see Paul's attitude, his, the way he looked at those who were praying for him? He said, we're striving together. He believed that when they were praying for him, they were actually participating with him in his ministry. Isn't that an amazing thought? To the Ephesians, he wrote in Ephesians 6, 19, and also for me, pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Even though Paul was a very bold and courageous preacher, he acknowledged his deep need of prayer that he might continue to be bold. As a result of the prayers of the, of the Philippian church, Paul confidently claimed while he was in chains in Philippians 1.19, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Brothers and sisters, we learn from these verses that prayer is the rec recognition that we are, we are impotent, but God is omnipotent. When God's people pray, God's power is energized and his sovereign purposes realized. Remember, brothers and sisters, that though God is sovereign, that doesn't mean that we don't have any, any purpose in life. It's not like we are robots. Uh, the, the paradox is, is that when God, as God works sovereignly, he has chosen to work that sovereign work through us. Isn't that amazing? God works sovereignly through his people. We learn from these verses that prayer is the means which God has ordained to release his mighty power. Prayer then is not the attempt to manipulate God into giving us what we want, but, is, but it is the submission of our wills and the exaltation of his plans and purposes. Like everything else God gives us, prayer is to glorify him. Prayer, therefore, honors God, and in honoring God, it helps others. Prayer makes us co-laborers in the ministries we pray for. We've, this is the last point that I want to remind you of, the purpose and the power of prayer. Prayer makes us co-laborers in the ministries and the people that we pray for. L listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 41. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Isn't this amazing? Brothers and sisters, you may not be a preacher. You may not be an evangelist. You may not be able to do some of the kinds of things that other Christians can do or perhaps other ministries are doing. But brothers and sisters, you can pray. You can pray. And when we pray, we participate in those ministries. As Paul said in Romans chapter 15 and verse uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 30, that when we pray, we strive together with those whom we're praying for. And what a wonderful thought that someday when we stand before our Lord Jesus Christ, not only is He going to reward those who, whom uh, we prayed for, but He's going to reward us for praying 
with them and for them. Oh, what a great God that we have. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope that you have learned this morning of the not to fear suffering and troubles and trials. They are wonderful tools that God uses to teach us to rely on him, to make us a blessing to others. Uh, let us remember that, that quote that, or the reality that uh, trouble and trial are often God's tools to work in us that nothing else will create. And brothers and sisters, we need to learn to submit. We need to learn to rejoice and give thanks in the midst of our troubles and trials. I know that's not easy. Uh, that certainly isn't possible in and, in and of our own strength. But let's pray. Let's ask God to give us that grace to accept what he has given to us, to work our way through it, and to trust God to use it not only to bless us, but to bless those around us. So, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And, Lord, we're so grateful for the Apostle Paul. We're thankful for uh, using him so mightily and powerfully. Lord, we're just amazed at what our brother was uh, was willing to go through for the sake of being a faithful minister of the gospel. Lord, we acknowledge that we fall so far short of that. And yet, our Father, you have indeed still called us not only to be saved, but to, but to suffer. And Father, whatever the suffering we're going through or will go through, how we pray that we might have this attitude of the Apostle Paul, one of submission, one of recognizing that, that it is for your glory and for our good, but that it is also for the good of those around us, that we might use the comfort that we've received in our troubles to be a blessing to others. And then our Father, help us to remember the wonderful blessing and power of prayer. Oh, how we pray, our Father, that we might be more prayerful, that we might be more diligent, Lord, in uplifting and upholding others in prayer. And Lord, we're just amazed that as we do so, you will reward us richly we become participants with them in their ministries. What an, a glorious thought that should encourage us to be more faithful in prayer. So, Father, we ask these things and pray them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to leave you with a, a little benediction from Jude. It's a wonderful benediction that um, should encourage your heart as we uh, continue to worship the Lord throughout this day. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. May God give you a wonderful Lord's Day. May you be blessed.